the Renoir of um, 1877, 260,000, 270,000, 280,000, 290,000, and 290,000. It's on my left, sold at $290,000. 290,000 then. Not eight, the Cezanne tulips at one million. At one million dollars. And it's you on the right now. One million one hundred. One million two hundred. One million three hundred. At one million three hundred thousand. One million four hundred thousand. At one million four hundred thousand. Telephone bid one million four hundred thousand dollars. At one million four hundred thousand dollars, it's on the telephone, sold at one million four hundred then. Modern art. It's worth billions and billions, so it must be important. But why? The answer remains as mysterious as the modern artists themselves. To bring them and their challenge to tradition closer to us is the aim of this film. Museum of Modern Art, wondering what it's like to see life with Picasso's eyes. Why Picasso? Because even for people who have no interest in the painting of our time, Picasso is modern art. And they're right, too. Good or bad, art in the past was always in the service of religion, ideology, or reality. Modern art, good or bad, is its own master, and nobody has demonstrated this terrifying freedom more tellingly than Picasso. When you come right down to it, he said, all you have is yourself. Yourself is a sun with a thousand rays in your belly. Imagine if cameras had existed to preserve living images of Leonardo, Velasquez, Rembrandt, and other Renaissance masters. That's what intrigued me. To help record the great modern art and artists in a kind of cinematic mosaic. But first, let's ask a question that puzzles many of us. What is modern art? Why all these distortions? abstractions, and revolts against tradition. How did it get from cubism to pop? Where's it going next? Well, let's take a look. What about all that? Wild, way out, Insane? Not really. No, we'll show you there's method and meaning to the apparent madness. Picasso wasn't a revolutionary when he, when he painted these. He was influenced then by the great 19th century French master Paul Cézanne. A 
of course, Cezanne wasn't engaged in this undertaking alone. His one-time companions, the Impressionists, had already taken a formidable step in the same direction. They left the darkness of their studio and went out to paint in the Paris of the late 19th century and in the surrounding countryside. It's important to remember the early moderns grew up in horse and buggy days before the first airplane, before color reproduction, in an era when photography influenced artists to seek new ways of interpreting reality. And now we'll find out why Cezanne, after rejection and ridicule, achieved fame and was championed by the great author Emile Zola as the father of modern art. We invited Pierre Schneider, a noted French art critic who also writes for the New York Times, to tell us why. Our film's director, Herbert Klein, accompanies the critic to Maurice Denis' painting, Homage to Cézanne. Why Cézanne? Because uh, as uh, Matisse, uh, who is one of the greatest of modern painters, said, uh, Cézanne is the father of us all. So in a way, you might say that they're uh, paying tribute to the man with whom modern painting began. Cézanne is only one of the fathers of modern art. Uh, modern art has as many fathers as uh, you have painters. Gauguin is another father of modern painting, and so is uh, Manet, and so is Van Gogh and so are a dozen others. I think that's true, but most people don't know how to adjust themselves to the whole scope of modern art. After the Renaissance, beginning, say, with Giotto, uh, painting was like a, like a window opened on an imaginary world. Now, what Cézanne did, and you can see it very well in this picture, by making his brush strokes visible and by closing up the perspective, because I should say that perspective was the way in which you open that uh, world beyond. Whereas the uh, fictitious deep space, the space beyond the window, belonged, you might say, to the subject. The surface, on the other hand, is the realm upon which the artist rules supreme. We've moved quite a, a long ways from uh, Cezanne. We're really in the middle. So you might say the gateway to modern art, uh, Picasso and uh, Matisse. In fact, I think it was Picasso who said about uh, the two of them, they ought to call us South Pole and North Pole. In a way, he was summarizing uh, the kind of uh, uh, main forces at the beginning of modern art. With Picasso, you had form, structure, uh, with uh, Matisse, color, the pictures speak more and more straightforwardly. That's the great change in modern art. Great artists justify the French poet Baudelaire's remark that genius is nothing more or less than childhood recovered at will. Childhood now equipped for self-expression. And here, at the end of his life, is Matisse creating his famous chapel despite crippling illness. At 83, he wrote, in looking at life with the eyes of a child, of the artist's ability to penetrate that flood of ready-made images which are to the eye like prejudices are to the mind, in order to discover and give form to innermost feelings. Many years earlier, he'd written, I dream of an art of balance, of purity and serenity. But Matisse never abandoned the radical freedom of forms and colors that his early critics had derided as fauve or wild beast. And then, after Matisse's fauvism, the next giant steps were taken by another Frenchman, Georges Braque, and by his very close friend, a young Spaniard named Picasso. Together, they became co-founders of the most influential movement in our century, first named and ridiculed by a sardonic art critic as Cubism, and then championed by a great French poet, Apollinaire. No film exists of these two artists in their youth, but there are scenes in later life of Georges Braque. Braque said, one must not imitate what one wants to create. But in 1908, not to imitate took enormous courage. It was Cubism that gave Brock the courage by emancipating him from the tyranny of the model, the subject. That adventure began when he met Picasso. 
I don't paint the world I see, said Picasso. I paint the world as I imagine it. Picasso, after his still fairly traditional blue and pink periods, had just taken the big leap. He had painted Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Five naked women in a brothel. And the first monument of modern art. To read Les Demoiselles d'Avignon from left to right is like going through the increasingly radical phases that led Picasso to his epoch-making discovery. Cubism completed the revolution begun by Cézanne. In seeking to show all aspects of an object at once, Cubism broke up volumes into a multitude of flat facets. The painting was now a surface. Art was born underground, in caves, in tombs, in catacombs. This, however, is just a station in the Paris subway. It's named Louvre, after the illustrious museum nearby. For centuries, living artists have gone to the Louvre for inspiration. Was the advent of modern art to put an end to that practice? At first, it seemed so. Let us burn the Louvre, had been the avant-garde's war cry ever since Pissarro and Monet. Cézanne shouted it too. Yet later, he said, the Louvre is the book in which we all learn to read. Killing your father doesn't mean you have no father. Every modern artist has dreamed to have his pictures hung in the Louvre. For Picasso, this dream came true. For a few days, even the Mona Lisa was removed to make room for Picasso's work. The artist didn't come to see his works hung among the Louvre's masterpieces. Nor did he respond to worldwide tributes, even that of President Georges Pompidou. The president said, we're here to pay homage to Picasso, not only as an artist, but also as a man who chose to live in France. Scores of friends and admirers came, and of course, Picasso's staunch supporter and dealer since the days of Cubism, Daniel Henri Canweiler. Mr. Canweiler, could you tell us your emotions and about seeing uh, your friend Picasso's works on exhibit in the Louvre? Well, in the right man in the right place. It was quite natural. You felt he belonged in the Louvre. Exactly. He's going to be there, of course, for forever. Painting, said Picasso, is stronger than I am. It makes me do what it wants. And what it wanted him to do was to paint. And paint he did almost every day and night of his life, right up to his death at 93. J'aime beaucoup les gens. Tout le monde. Et si elle n'aurait pas de chien, je sais pas qui j'aimerais faire. J'aimerais me mettre un bouton de porte, n'est-ce pas? Un pot de chambre, n'importe quoi. It seemed as if in order to live up to the freedom which Cubism had given him, Picasso, day after day, had felt the need to turn his back not only on the history of painting and sculpture, but also on his own past. In 1910, a Jewish youth arrived in Paris from his native Russia. Today, Marc Chagall is world famous. Cubism was a rational movement. Chagall reintroduced the irrational. In those days, he recalls, you didn't talk aloud about your dreams. If she had something so damn fantastic for you, for me, it's not fantastic. These are the elements that help me to construct a painting to my way, irreal. Chagall made his dreams acceptable by fitting them in Cubist dress. Cubist bottles were straight, Chagall puts it. I tilted them. The poet Reverdy had called Cubism a methodical adventure. As the adventure became less risky, the method gradually hardened into a system. Chagall was among the first to show a way out. des vitraux que je complète pour une chapelle près de Londres. C'est une chapelle assez tragique parce que c'est une fille qui s'est noyée avec son fiancé et la mère a voulu donner un monument à elle. Commissioned by André Marot, Chagall painted the Paris opera ceiling as a gift to his adopted homeland. Chagall's Jerusalem windows were another gift. 
one that expresses a modern artist's concepts of the tribal law of ancient Israel. It represents a contemporary tribute to the heroic biblical past. Here is art that reflects the spirit of the prophets. Monsieur Chagard, vous nous montrez votre livre sur Exodus. Vous pourriez nous donner quelques explications sur certaines de ces photographies. Je qu'il est, quand on me proposé les livres faire des, pour Exodus, après tant de choses que j'ai déjà fait, dans notre époque, j'étais assez excité. C'est vrai, c'est peut-être parce que j'ai déjà fait la Bible. Je pensais pourquoi faire encore Exodus, mais ça m'est touché parce qu'on peut dire que c'est assez actuel. Il me semble que moi-même, je commence à aller en exode, autant que toute l'humanité, d'ailleurs, chaque jour en exode. Having survived wars and exile, Chagall now lives at Saint-Paul-de-Vence on the French Riviera. Not far from Chagall's home is the Mai Foundation. Its founders, Mr. and Mrs. Aimé Mai, wanted it to be a living center rather than a museum for the art of our time. Built by architect José Luis Set, contains works by Brock, Matisse, Leger, Calder, and by Juan Miro, who filled an outdoor labyrinth with his three-dimensional fantasies. Giacometti's sculpture animates the courtyard which the Chagalls and Aimé Might are visiting today. Chagall is also represented in the Might Foundation. He works as hard as ever, and though he now relies more on color than on form, it is still the village of his childhood in Russia, transfigured by fantasy that he paints. Dostoevsky once wrote, I grant you two plus two equals four is an excellent thing. But to tell the truth, two plus two equals five is a charming thing. He could have been defining the charm of Chagall. Je ne sais pas quoi vous dire. Je sais que je souffre dans mon atelier. C'est une grande révolution chez moi, à la maison. Et je suis malheureux de faire ça. Et, et je ne sais pas qu'est-ce qu'il faut penser. Mais dans 100 ans, dans 1000 ans, vous demandez le public ici à côté qu'est-ce qu'il pense. Et moi, je n'ai pas d'opinion. But the critics have so many opinions. <laughs> What do you think of the critics? The seule critique, c'est ma femme. Quand elle dit que c'est bon, c'est bon. Mais les autres, quand on parle du moi bien, les autres, je ne crois pas. Quand on me gronde, je crois. Here in Rome lives Giorgio de Chirico, Chagall's contemporary. He too created his first significant pictures around 1910. Born in Greece, of Italian parents, the scenes which De Chirico represents and the way in which he represents them are purely classical, or would be, if it weren't for the strange, hypnotic atmosphere that pervades them, turning them into what De Chirico called a tragedy of serenity. Silence weighs on empty streets and petrified interiors. There's a sense of the ominous, of impending disasters. The Renaissance setting becomes the stage of an indecipherable drama risen from the subconscious, a brightly lit mystery. Maestro, the many paintings of the sun that you are now doing, what do they signify symbolically? Uh, the moon is uh, the hope, because I hope that the humanity will become better in the future. I am skeptic, but I hope that my husband will be right. What artist or school would you say influenced you most? Uh, nobody. I was never influenced from, from other artists. I have studied uh, always the old masters and I think uh, that I not be a modern artist, only a contemporary artist. It began with a manifesto which was written in 1909 and which uh, preceded the pictures that illustrated it. Marinetti said, 
art should be a slap in the face. A masterpiece uh, cannot exist except by struggle. He said also, a masterpiece is always accompanied by aggression. This is a sculpture by Boccioni, as the painting behind me. Uh, it's called, it, is, it represents a walking man. It's actually called uh, Unique Forms in Continuous Space. Uh, Boccioni was perhaps the greatest master of a movement which he helped to found together with Balla, Russolo, uh, Severini, and Carra. The futurists were dissatisfied with the subject matter of contemporary painting. They felt that the fruit bowls, the apples, the mandolins, which painters of their time were representing, weren't really part of their time. Their time was streetcars, uh, people milling in, uh, crowds milling in the, in the city, like uh, Boccioni's City Rising, for instance. And they felt that they had to represent this motion as Marinetti, who was the poet and the first uh, author of a manifesto of futurism, said, um, the, uh, a, a car is actually more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. Munich, the city where Hitler denounced modern art as degenerate. Here, during the 1972 Olympics, German authorities put on a grand exhibition to remind us that modern art came into its own by opening itself to influences outside the narrow limits of the Western tradition. Today, from the Amazonian Indians to the Eskimos, from Polynesia to Mexico, every culture, no matter how remote in time or space, has become an active force on the modern art as shown here. Manet's portrait of his and Cezanne's champion, Emil Zola, included this tribute to Japan's woodcut influences. It all began with the interest shown by Impressionists and Post-Impressionists for popular Japanese woodcuts. The protruding eyes of this ancient mask of the Wabi tribe has its counterpart in a modern sculpture by Miro. African art made its decisive impact on the Fauve and the Cubis and on such independent artists as Modigliani. This primitive tribesman had no artistic theory, yet, as in this painting by Paul Clay, both express Clay's theory that the essential creative process takes place below the level of consciousness. Throughout Europe, the modern artists found allies in the fight for recognition, but they were surprised and happy to receive enthusiastic support from America. Also from a great writer, from Gertrude Stein, who was living right here in Paris, and over in New York from the noted photographer collector Alfred Stieglitz. Early important collectors included, of course, the Rockefellers, the Guggenheims, the Whitneys, the Hirshhorns, among others. And so our story of modern art becomes international as this crosses the Atlantic to America. When art ceases to rely on tradition, its real justification becomes sympathy. That is what the great French painter Eugène Delacroix meant when he said, we are not understood, we are accepted. But one can only accept what one meets and becomes familiar with. That was the gift made by New York's Museum of Modern Art. MoMA, as it is affectionately known, brought them together. Like Le Demoiselle d'Avignon, Matisse's The Dance towers above 20th century painting. Blue for the sky, green for the earth, red for the figures. Matisse summed it up. Never has painting been more simple and more direct. Kirchner's Street in Dresden is a fine example of Expressionism, a German movement that adopted the violent colors and exaggerated forms of Fauvism to express spiritual anguish and terror. Hans Hoffmann was trained in Germany, the land of Expressionism. After moving to the United States, his teaching and his example proved an important influence on the American art that was to emerge after the Second World War. Marguerite traps the viewer in a dizzying world where appearance and reality have quietly gone berserk. There are fairy tales to be written for grown-ups, 
Andre Breton said at the beginning of Serialism. His prophecy has been made true by the Catalonian painter Miró. Like many other contemporary artists, Miró seeks inspiration in accident, chance. But when Miró uses chance, it miraculously turns into order. Asked whom he regarded as the best of the younger moderns, Matisse replied, Miró, because he may well represent anything on his canvas, but if on a certain point he has placed a red spot, you could be sure that it is there and nowhere else that it had to be. Rather than setting out to paint something, Miro explains, I begin painting, and as I paint, the picture begins to assert itself or suggest itself. The form becomes a sign for a woman or a bird as I work. The first stage is free, unconscious. This huge, amiable American walking along a gentle French river is one of the men who changed the course of sculpture. Up to Alexander Calder, everyone thought that sculpture had to be heavy, immobile, solemn. Calder's metal mobiles are so carefully balanced that the slightest breeze will make them shiver or sway. With the cheerful modesty of a tinkerer, he has made sculpture the royal gift of motion and levity. Like his painter friend Miro, who turns frequently to sculpture, Calder often changes pace by painting in colorful forms so free they often seem to move. Since the arrival of Sandy Calder on the art scene around 1930, humor has become a serious matter. In this studio, Calder works every day, creating an infinite variety of sculptural expressions that he says were first dismissed as toy making. It has taken this jolly artisan to remind us that the material of sculpture isn't stone, bronze, or wood but space. With such wire portraits as that of Josephine Baker, called to prove that sculpture could be swift as a drawing and witty as a cartoon. Outside the foundry and nearby tour, Calder's three-foot model groaned to the huge sculptor created from the artist's vision of the finished work which offers ever-changing relationships for the viewer. After the sounds of sculpture give way to the quiet of night, his wife and grandchild reflect the love of life that Calder expresses in his work. These are Calder's hands in an early film by Hans Richter as the sculptor manipulates his fantastic one-man circus, the best illustration of the German playwright Schiller's definition of art as play. In 1917, a handful of writers and artists founded a movement which they derisively baptized Dada. It included Hans Richter, whom we are visiting in his Connecticut home. Uh, Fifty-five years ago, we founded the Dada movement, which today plays an important part in modern art. Our central experience in Dada, which joined us, in Zurich was uh, the experience of chance, that you could take chances in, in uh, organizing your material. You never knew where you would end. And that's the same thing I experienced till today. When I put my collars together one day when Arp was making a drawing. He 
didn't like it and tore it to pieces and threw the pieces on the floor. And when he looked down, there uh, on the floor, there were the, the uh, there was a drawing the way he wanted to do it. There were Zara and Ball and Arp and Yanko and I and others. In Paris was Breton and in New York, Picabia and Duchamp and Man Ray. And in Berlin was Hausmann and George Gross. One of the most important people at that time was uh, Schwitters. We uh, tried to find a um, complete liberty from rules in mobilizing our unconscious. An echo of Dada's violence survives in All the Dreams Money Can Buy, in which Richter filmed Max Ernst, Marcel Duchamp, Alexander Calder, and Man Ray in New York City in the 1940s. In this scene, Max Ernst enacts a role that reflects Dada's nightmarish fantasies. Ernst, whose long career has taken him from Cologne, Germany to Paris, from Paris to America and back to France, started out as a Dadaist. But Dada only cleared the stage. The new action was provided from about 1922 onward by surrealism. Here's Paris, Max Ernst's work on view at the Musée de l'Orangerie. Surrealism aimed to establish, as its founder, the poet André Breton said, the omnipotence of dreams by evading or destroying the controls of reason. Max Ernst was the first to apply this program to art, using chance combinations of unrelated figures and questioning the accidents of texture, much as Leonardo da Vinci saw monsters in the cracks of an old wall, Ernst unleashed the images buried in his subconscious. The pictures born under his brush seemed to lend visual substance to the invisible discourse of the mineral, botanical, and zoological realms. Max Ernst has proved that one could see more by closing one's eyes than by keeping them open. The French Minister of Culture, Jacques Duhamel, greets German-born Max Ernst as an honorary citizen of France. Strangely enough, Venice, which from Carpaccio to Turner and from Guardi to Renoir has always fascinated painters in love with Earth's visible splendors, has become the home of the first ensemble of works by artists bent upon revealing the invisible, the Peggy Guggenheim collection. It's a fabulous collection, Mrs. Guggenheim. Well, originally I started out to make a complete survey of all the non-realistic movements of modern art, beginning with Cubism in 1910, through Dadaism and through Surrealism and all the other movements. And I tried always to get the best example of each movement that I could, so as to make a really perfect uh, historical survey. Uh, you told me about the artists in your gallery beginning your collection. How was that? Well, actually, I had a gallery in London called Guggenheim Jeanne, where I used to bring pictures over from Paris and show them in London. And when I was not successful in selling anything, which was usually the case, I bought a picture from each exhibition just to console the artist. Do you go to the 1971 period in your collection? Yes, with the exception of pop art. No pop art? Well, I don't think pop art has anything to do with art. Would you say it um, is a reflection of our society in a way? Yes, but that doesn't mean there is anything to do with art. The Paganini of Surrealism is the Catalan painter Salvador Dali. Since 1929, Dali has been transcribing his Freudian obsessions and hallucinations in a painstakingly academic style. He rightly defined his pictures as hand-painted dream photographs. So in a way, he is a, an anti-modernist, since modern painting had precisely done its utmost to obscure, to wall up the window. All Catalonians are paranoiacs, Dali once said. The inventor of a paranoiac critical activity explored his madness with method. Je choisis la pieuvre. 
Parce que Dali, toujours, a été amoureux des structures molles, superviscoses et compulsives. Et la pieuvre, dans ses compulsions, il offre une constante de viscosité, un continu mouvement qui se prête parfaitement bien pour l'apothéose qui est celui de l'espace. The Guggenheim Museum, built by that giant of 20th century architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright, has long extended its hospitality to avant-garde artists. We enter the museum as it is showing the work of one of the most original French artists to have emerged since World War II, Jean Dubuffet. He's fascinated with art that isn't produced by culture specialists, professional artists. Instead, he looks to graffiti, the infallible creation of children, of the insane. Dubuffet's aggressive, humorous, seemingly primitive style feeds on this concern with what he calls raw art. The poetic world of childhood, humor, primitivism, the irrational, all these traits are already present in the work of Paul Klee, who was born and who died in Switzerland. Indeed, nearly every revolution of contemporary art can be found in Klee, reduced to toy size. Sophisticated professor of innocence, theoretician of spontaneity, peeping Tom of cosmic mysteries, Clay consigned to the miniature size of a watercolor the discoveries which the painting of the second half of our century was to unfold on a monumental scale. We haven't spoken yet of what many people regard as the major revolution of 20th century art, the birth of abstract art, an art that dispenses altogether with the figuration of reality. The Dutch-born Mondrian began to reduce the forms he saw, a tree, a church, until daily passing appearances gave way to pure, permanent essences. By the eve of the First World War, at about the same time as Mondrian, Russian-born Vasily Kandinsky invented hot abstraction. His early Fauvist paintings are as dynamic as Mondrian's astatic. It was not the wind that swept Kandinsky's landscapes, but the spirit. The world outside was an obstacle to the expression of what he calls his inner necessity. His stormy improvisations removed that obstacle. After the First World War, his work gradually cooled down and crystallized into non-objective icons celebrating his unflagging belief in what he called the spiritual in art. A few years after the end of the Second World War, a new uh, pictorial revolution took place. In Europe, it was called uh, mostly uh, abstraction lyrique, or peinture de geste, gesture painting, what had been happening was that the uh, perspective had gradually been drying up inside the picture. And as the uh, back of the picture moved up toward the surface until it finally coincided with it, the subject matter gradually moved up like a bubble too. And when it reached the surface, then it exploded. And you might say that the work of uh, Riopel or of Pollock, of Klein, uh, of people like Soulage in France or Motherwell in America relate in this general sense, but are completely individual and unrelated insofar as, the, as they, uh, their looks are concerned. Ideologies had led the world to chaos. The post-war period had become wary of them. Like Pierre Soulage, it set its faith in the individual, on the sincerity of instinct, confident that the artist's emotion could easily communicate with the viewer's emotion. I am not really painting. I know. I you cannot can... work for a camera. I'm, I'm glad, Pierre, though, that you decided to show us your tools and how you paint, would you? Yes. But uh, I paint not uh, my tools. I paint with my tools, but uh, 
Uh, my uh, real tools are uh, my mind and my heart. And uh, it's not possible to use this uh, for a camera. What about the people that do not know too much about abstract painting? Do you feel that your work reaches them, like the figurative painting and other painting of previous periods? Mm. I, I, I think uh, every painter paints first for himself. But if I feel very strongly that I paint, I am sure I met another man who feel too uh, and uh, who uh, like uh, my, my work. And the black is, uh, is a color I like very much because uh, uh, with the black it is possible to have the more violent, uh, uh, violent uh, light. And could you tell us about your tools? I never saw anyone paint quite like this. Yes. I don't like uh, tools uh, for artists. I prefer uh, tools uh, of, uh, for uh, house painters. <laughs> or I prefer do my, my, my tools, uh, make myself. Let's, Let's see what this is like. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Looks like I got a soulage original. <laughs> yes, but don't hang your uh, hand on the wall. On the, wall. <laughs> <laughs> the ability of the new abstraction to act as a universal language is demonstrated by Zhao Wu Qi. He arrived in Paris from his native Peking in 1947, and within a few years, and without renouncing the calligraphic subtleties of the Chinese tradition, he had assimilated the revolutionary Western developments and begun to exploit the lyric possibilities of abstraction. What's this picture about, Wuki? This picture? Oh, this, this picture is for my wife. I mean, she's dead five it's and a half months before, you know. It's in memory to her. When did you leave China? Before the revolution. And why did you leave then? Because uh, I ne never saw the original pictures before and uh, do you have the impression that modern art is opposed to your tradition no i don't think so i think the modern pen is now it's uh, very close to the uh, i mean very ancient uh, chinese art too it's difficult to say a chinese painter or french painter or american painter i think it's uh, mostly important it's uh, maybe international not local Perhaps the most energetic center of abstraction was New York. It is here that abstract expressionism was born. Action painting, as it also came to be known, marked the emergence of America as a powerful original force on the stage of world art. Abstract artists like Gorky, Pollock, Klein, Roscoe, Newman, Gottlieb, de Kooning, and Motherwell did, however, share an energy that led them to paint on a monumental scale. Jackson Pollock had given action painting its most radical expression, dripping paint on his canvas as if in a trance. He created a world that did not look like nature, but possessed nature's inexhaustible vitality. like a beast of prey tearing to shreds its victim. His savage impetus carried him over again and again into total abstraction. For myself, I start with a glimpse of something. And then, in the end, I have an everyday language, a picture. I want to give somebody else something of a glimpse. I 
have a little glimpse of something. And I find myself staying with it. Not so much with this particular flash or glimpse, but with the, um, with the emotion of it, which is my way of doing it, a very innocent way of doing it. Each new glimpse is determined by many, many, many glimpses before. I paint fast to keep that glimpse. One of the most articulate members of the New York School of Abstract Expressionism the triumph after World War II is Robert Motherwell. Now that Gorky, Pollock, Klein, Rothko, Newman, and David Smith are gone, he is one of the few survivors of the heroic age of American art. From my standpoint, I would like to be an economical painter. I would like to deal with the essences in a platonic sense. Uh, painting is an extremely limited medium. It can't really well show action it can't tell narrative very well. Uh, what it can do is get an instant moment of contemplation or of the ultimate weights of one's feeling. But in painting, one cannot do Oedipus Rex or Hamlet. We invited Robert Hughes, the art critic of Time magazine, to help us interpret the works of American artists. Well, of all the elegies for the Spanish Republic, the big ones and the little ones and the in-between ones that have led up to this, uh, about how many? Uh, this is about the 120th. They overlap a little bit. And this language of black and white that you're using is very much part of a specific pared-down language of tragedy, you know? Uh, part of whatever the basic archetype of this thing is, is somberness and black and white. So they have little fragments of color left, but it, it cannot stand more than that amount of color. It's difficult for paintings to be dramatic, and consequently, though there's a certain tragic overtone, there's also, I think, an elegiac quality. I take an elegy to be a funeral lamentation or a funeral song for something that one cared about. The Spanish elegies are not political, but my private insistence that a terrible death happened that should not be forgot. But the pictures are also general metaphors of the contrast between life and death and their interrelations. When speaking of the Spanish Civil War, we are at once reminded of the most tragic picture painted in our time, Picasso's Guernica. Picasso said, I have always believed and still believe that the artists who live and work in accordance with spiritual values cannot remain indifferent the conflict in which the highest values of humanity and of civilization are at stake. Guernica, a small town in northern Spain, had been bombed on April 26, 1937 by Hitler's aviation. The event anticipated the horrors of the war that was soon to engulf the whole world. Two months later, Picasso had completed the canvas that expresses his indignation at this massacre of the innocents. C'est fait avec des intentions tellement du moment, de l'époque et l'état dans lequel tout le monde et moi nous nous trouvons. C'est très difficile. Au moment de Guernica, j'ai fait Guernica, n'est-ce pas? C'était une grande catastrophe, même le commencement de beaucoup d'autres que nous avons suivis, n'est-ce pas? Mais enfin, c'est comme ça. With his peace symbol of the dove, Picasso reminds us that contemporary art, even when it is apparently absorbed with purely aesthetic concerns, is seldom close to the events of our lives.
Paris again, in the city's great museum of modern art. No, of course, we realize it would take a, a dozen films to depict the masters of all the major art movements, from the Italian futurists to the German expressionists, the Russian constructivists. We know that we risk people protesting that their favorites are being left out, but all the same, we are going to show you more important modern artists than have ever been in one film before. From cubism to a kind of epic realism, Fernand Léger remained faithful to his basic purpose, bringing art closer to the people. So he painted the machines, which are the reality of our time, and he painted the people of our time, at work or at play. His tools were simple form, brutal color, colossal scale. My ultimate aim, Leger states, is to obtain a maximum of power and even of violence on a wall. Like his friend Miro, Giacometti began as a surrealist. But surrealism never made him produce stranger visions than when he decided to represent people just as he saw them. Francis Bacon, one of England's major painters, is also concerned with capturing the appearance of men and women. In the process, he submits them to tortures far worse than those invented by Giacometti. Critics have said that the sadistic distortions of Bacon's figures reflect the cruelty of an age that has lived through the nightmare of fascism. But Bacon says, there is no torture in my paintings. And in a sense, he's right. The torture is not in the subject, but in the paint. Modern art has opened an abyss between paint and the subject. It took violence to cross it. Masson and Miro at the opening of his Paris retrospective. This is John Russell, the noted London Times critic, author of an authoritative book on Bacon. For Bacon, it is not the screen that counts, but the picture. Speaking about one of those shrieking faces that made him famous, Bacon said, I wanted to make the inside of the mouth as beautiful as a mummy. André Masson is another key figure in surrealism. He spent the war years in the United States where his automatic technique was still influenced on the generation of Pollock. Au début, il y avait seulement des lignes qui étaient plutôt celles d'un paysage à Et puis j'ai laissé aller complètement la ligne. Et ça a fini par être une femme. Alors, il y a une métamorphose continuelle dans mes tableaux. Quand il est commencé, je ne peux pas savoir ce qui sera à la fin. C'est absolument impossible. Par ce côté-là, je suis fidèle au surréalisme. Il n'y a pas le moindre doute, n'est-ce pas? Masson's dreamlike surrealism is expressed vividly in the insects. We invited art critics Susie Gablik and John Russell to elicit the painter's views. Monsieur Masson, on vous demande quelle trace vous trouvez du surréalisme dans l'art d'aujourd'hui. Mais je trouve, chère madame, qu'il y a des traces du surréalisme dans tout. Je trouve que l'époque est surréaliste. Notre époque. Oui. Elle ne l'était pas avant la guerre de 1914. N'est-ce pas Mais après euh, le choc de la Première Guerre mondiale, de la Grande Guerre, il y a eu évidemment un dérangement de, des esprits. Le surréalisme allait, n'est-ce pas, à l'avant dans beaucoup de domaines, n'est-ce pas, psychologie, littérature. Le surréalisme croit à l'image. Oui. Exactement comme les psychanalystes croient à l'image, oui. à l'image. Évidemment, le surréalisme, voulant faire une mythologie, 
du désir, en somme, une mythologie, un monde, un rêve, hein, ont besoin de figuration. Et l'art abstrait est le refus de la figuration. Hein. Le cubisme est près de l'abstraction. Il est toujours, je veux dire, à la frontière. Mais par exemple, ni Picasso, ni Braque, ni Max Ernst, ni moi-même n'avons renoncé à l'art figuratif. Here we are amidst one of the greatest modern art treasures in France, the studio which Constantine Brancusi would come to Paris on foot at the turn of the century from his native Romania, bequeathed to his adopted country. Now, uh, up to the Renaissance and during the Renaissance, sculptors and painters were on a par. Uh, you might say that Donatello, Michelangelo, were every bit as uh, innovative, as inventive, as uh, Giotto or Piero della Francesca. But gradually, as the centuries went on, this changed. And what happened was that more and more, uh, painting became the avant-garde art, and you might say that sculpture fell behind. So that if you take, for instance, the end of the 19th century, at a time when Manet and the Impressionists and then Cezanne and the Cubists uh, were developing an increasingly free art, uh, sculpture was still working in the wake of the Renaissance. Take the greatest sculptor of the time, Rodin. He was still attached completely to the subject matter and submitted to it uh, with genius, but nonetheless, traditionally. Uh, the break really comes with uh, Constantine Brancusi. It was Brancusi then who took the revolutionary step of freeing uh, sculpture from its uh, century-old submission to sub subject matter by trying to get at the reality behind appearances, what technically uh, Brancusi has done is to tell modern sculpture from now on, you don't have to submit yourself to the way things look. You are the master, you can do anything. And that, in a way, has been the message. For Brancusi, abstraction doesn't mean arbitrary. What he tried to do was simply to see the essence behind the appearance. His ideas of the seal or of the bird or of the woman's head or the child's head are perfectly made objects, pure objects. Born in Russia, Jacques Lipschitz, like many other artists, was attracted to Paris. Soon he became the Cubist sculptor. This meant not simply aping the faceted look of Cubist painting, but applying to volumes the analytic scrutiny Picasso and Braque had applied to flat images. Lipschitz broke his subject down into geometric components, which he then reassembled at will. After the First World War, his sculpture became more fluid and lyrical, sometimes to the point of eloquence. He's a master of an international post-Cubist style, which he has helped to create. You consider yourself a revolutionary in art? You know, sculpture has been made since uh, probably hundreds of thousands of years ago, and all kinds of uh, things were done, you know. Uh, no, it, it, it doesn't mean a thing, this revolutionary thing. What about Cubism? It's generally considered... Uh... No, it's a... Uh, Revolution. I would say the first Cubist would be Cezanne uh, in reality. You know. uh, that's all baloney. It's all baloney, this revolution. You know, we have a stream which is going from the prehistoric times and uh, it continues, and that's all. I, I don't believe in revolution. Revolution is, is a kind of a precipitated moment of failure. You know about the American Rescue Commission for the artists when Hitler came? But I was, I was saved by that. I was saved by that. Where were you? In France. And how did they persuade you? I, I, I did, well, I had a few friends which just uh, threw me out from, from from Toulouse, where I was working at that time, because I had to abandon my house in Paris. Hitler was there, you know, and I'm Jewish. So uh, I couldn't speak a word of English. I said, what 
will they do? They were stupid. They were stupid. I, I thought that uh, in America, uh, even uh, you don't have any trees or these skyscrapers. I don't. It completely, completely stupid. You are almost 80 years old. Do you feel that age is affecting your approach to your work at all? Sculptor should live very, very long because uh, every day I see that I learn something. Well, Titian lived to be 98 or so. It's not enough for me. No. You want to go over 100? Oh, yes. If I can go to 200, I will. I'm sure that I will become a good sculptor. Pray for me. I'll pray. <laughs> okay. Soon after, Jacques Lipchitz died. Foremost among English sculptors is a coal miner's son who, as a boy, fell in love with the masterpieces of Michelangelo, Henry Moore. I think it's impossible uh, to imagine life uh, without art. I mean, life without any uh, music, without any singing, uh, without any uh, dancing, without... Uh, uh, any pictures, without sculpture, uh, all these things are what make our life different from animals. I mean, animals just go around looking only for what they need to eat. Uh, and if we only looked at what's necessary from a material point of view, our life would be very, very um, dull and, uh, and uh, uninteresting. I'm Richard Johnson. And like most people, my contact with Henry Moore so far has been through books, through seeing his sculptures and exhibitions, art galleries and so on. I'd read about the various influences in Moore's life, the mool, the Mexican rain god sculpture, which influenced Moore's art. What do you call this? It's called locking piece, because um, the two forms, this cut part, locks onto the other. And this will lift off, the whole uh, top piece will lift off the bottom piece. Um, this is the original plaster from which the bronze was made, because um, a sculptor doesn't make uh, a thing in bronze. You don't take a block of bronze and carve it. Uh, for bronze, if you want a sculpture in bronze, you must make it in something else first. And I use plaster mainly for my bronzes. You've got this other knife edge here. Oh, that's, uh, yes, all, all your ideas often repeat and come back because uh, a sculptor has ideas about form which he can't help. He has a form vision or a form uh, language which he uses like a, like you can tell a writer's style from the words that he has a, uh, a liking for. I don't bother about what it's going to be like in the future. One lives in the present uh, and you do what you feel and what uh, interests you without uh, taking into account uh, posterity or the future. Or, I mean, if it's valid now, it may be, remain valid in the future. But who's to know? Many critics regard Henry Moore as the finest photographer of his own work. And here for the first time, transferred to film, are the great sculptor's own photographs. Biggest influence of all uh, was the British Museum, where I could find out about all the different periods in the world's history of sculpture. And out of that, one could find one's own way by being shown a lot of different ways. Some of them became one's own. This is one of your latest works, Mr. Well, well this, is, this is uh, the largest one that I'm. Uh, doing at the moment. I often work on two or three things at once. Uh, and this is um, well, nearly complete before going to um, uh, the foundry or in this case, I think I'm going to build this up in stone. In this way, obviously showing that it's made up of several pieces of stone as you do with a building. And uh, this may lend itself to that kind of way. And the um, the layers give, the lines of the layers up above here give from underneath something, I think, which helps to, to show the shape. It 
gives you a section. It gives you uh, a cut, as it were, through it and shows us the section. Today, Henry Moore can proudly exhibit his art in the city that saw the rise of Michelangelo. One of England's most influential sculptors since Henry Moore is Anthony Caro. He's made sculpture step down, literally, from its pedestal, sprawl on the ground and grow in all directions. Stiff nobility has given way to informal, but intensely vital expansion. This sculpture is in the process of being fitted together. It's been made in a number of different components so that it can be dismantled, taken over to New York, and then we can get it up to the gallery and put it together. Later, it'll go to the shop blasters and come back all clean. I I've changed things uh, the day before exhibitions opened. I think that something about the feelings of the artist come across in sculptures just as, as something of the feelings of Mozart come across in his music. And it's very difficult to actually be more specific and say, I want this sculpture to be about this or that. You want it to be right about the forms that you've used. And if it's any good, it's going to mean more than that in the end. What could be more different from Caro's wide open constructions than the tight, accumulated niches filled with enigmatic objects conceived by America's most distinguished woman sculptor. Nevelson took the cubes of cubism and turned them into boxes which she crammed with private mysteries. I don't remember when I didn't want to be a sculptor. I took soap and carved it. I took uh, mud pies and worked it. If you have a visual mind, you're really born with it. Now, the house I was born to, I didn't like the house very much. Then we came to this country, and I didn't like the house very much. Then I got married in New York, and I didn't like the place. And I have really never been in a space that suited me. And since I'm a great-grandmother now, I thought, well, I'm going to make sculpture houses. And in the houses, when I put the sculpture in, they're movable, so that each person has the privilege somewhere of placement. Against the tidy scene of Midtown Manhattan, all aglitter glitter with technological brilliance and transparency, Nevelson reasserts man's need for introspection, secrecy, and primeval darkness. Louise, this one here is an aluminium piece, no? And it's fairly recent. It is, yes. Listen, it's a very Cubist sculpture in a way. Yes, well, I think my whole foundation is Cubism. I like the philosophy of Cubism, the medical translation, and I like the visual yeah. translation. Well, what kind of visual translations in Cubism did you pick up on especially? The cube. The cube, as such. <laughs> what, you mean like all these boxes and... Uh... Uh, with little things going in on them that you've got going on in these big Clark sculptures like this one? Yes, yes. Louise, when you talk about the meaning of your work, that meaning was pretty much bound up, for me anyway, with some sort of idea of mystery. Well, I think that it's human that we have mystery because there's no one on earth that's ever solved the human quality. And we, that is our whole search, is to find the greater humanness. Is there any difference, from your point of view, in being a major woman artist? Yes, I think there's a great difference, uh, from every point of view. Because we cannot deny that it has been a man's world. My experience is that men have a lot of machinery. They're caught in technology. I, I'm primitive. I use a scissors and a file and all the simple things to get what I want. I'm very sure of myself. of Rome stands the Vatican, seat of the Catholic Church, but also one of the world's most formidable treasures of art.
the world epopes of the Renaissance retained contemporary artists like Raphael and Michelangelo. The Pope John of our own century, though anything but a lover of pomp, resumed this practice. He asked Giacomo Manzu, who like himself came from Bergamo, to sculpt a new bronze door for St. Peter's. It was a courageous gesture, not that Manzu's style was particularly radical, but because this 11th son of a poor beetle was an avowed communist. The beloved pontiff can be seen on one of the panels which describes the death of St. Peter. Here is one of the many portraits of Pope John by Manzu. Cardinals and portrait studies of young girls have long been Manzu's favorite themes. He treats them in a smoothly eclectic, elegantly stylized manner characteristic of much contemporary Italian sculpture. His wife, Inga, frequently models for Manzu. So much so that he calls his studio outside Rome Inga's Museum. I am Inga Manzu. I know that many artists paint and sculpt their wives as models. And I am glad to see what my memories will be when I am older. <laughs> These are the Carrara quarries where Michelangelo once carved his marble blocks. This is Isamu Noguchi, American artist of part Japanese descent, preparing for his exhibition at New York's Whitney Museum. Sculpture as good, in the sense of uh, sculpture as a commodity, a uh, thing of value doesn't interest me. It's how it uh, functions, how it adds something to it by its existence, which is uh, something other than merely an object of value. Having a dialogue with a piece of sculpture, you see it, uh, it evokes certain kind of a communication which uh, develops its relation to the people who look at it. Cold abstraction had been driven from the forefront of the stage by hot abstraction, but it was not dead. In the 60s, it re-emerged under the guise of kinetic art, which aimed to set geometry in motion. One of its most passionate exponents is the Israeli artist Agam, who now works in Paris. particular painting I tried to do that you can put him anywhere except on the wall. The incorporation of motion and changing light into the medium of painting has not unnaturally attracted the attention of the man whose name is practically synonymous with the cinema, Henri Langlois, founder of the Cinematheque, the world's first and largest film museum. Uh, I found that your painting, if you have your sculpture, but I don't know what it is, uh, the connection between film and this is Newton, because it's the disk of Newton, and the disk of Newton is the secret of life, but Newton don't know that. Uh, Newton has uh, tried as a physician to express what is reality, but he did not took any notion of time. And so, uh, reality is not still life. But, you know, your painter is exactly the contrary of Newton, because Newton is a man who found the regulation. And you, your painting, which is not a painting, you have, uh, you say, kind of uh, evocation of all the, the world in the time, the universe in the time, because when you move, you see nothing. It's only when you stop. To the nagging question, what is art about, Op art answers, it is about visual stimuli and responses. One of its most talented practitioners is the English painter Bridget Riley. I remember um, Gauguin saying that a meter of green is greener than a centimeter. People often ask me if I use optical devices of some kind or uh, elaborate 
technical aids. Um, I've even been offered computers free of charge if I would like to use them, but this is all quite irrelevant and uh, rather amusing, I think. <laughs> Critic David Thompson, Bridget Riley, discusses her interpretation of painting as an act of vision. This painting, which is called Gamelan, and I know you, you choose the title after, the, after you've done the picture, but the relationship to music is very relevant, isn't it? Yes. The inner colours, the orange and the violet, swell and contract in different rhythms across the surface. Uh, the orange, for instance, comes up, or comes in, so to speak, very strong goes down sharply, comes back, but not quite so strong. Goes down, comes back, returns a little. Goes down and stays down, comes up again, small part, up stronger, up to the full straight and stays up. Now this picture, Late Morning, which is another, very much a painting about light, but it's also one of those paintings where you have to find out where you are in relation to it, don't you yes, find? Yes, yes. You, you, you can go close to it and it blows your mind. You, you can't focus anything, it's coming at you, and all sorts of extraordinary visual things. At very close range, it's an extremely violent painting. Further back, it becomes gradually more gentle. And each spectator can find his own uh, level of participation. One of the cheering things about the art of our age is the fact that outsiders can become as important in it as insiders. The well-known Portuguese painter, Vera de Silva, builds up a distinctly modern image with the very device that modern painting thought it had eliminated, perspective. Vera de Silva dreams of smuggling time into the space of her pictures. husband welcomed Pierre Schneider and young friends in her studio home near Paris. Ah, voilà. Hola. Petit Théâtre de Verdi, how do you translate oh, it? Oh, uh, an outdoor theater in the green. Yes. Oh, I see you have a figure in it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Nice figure, a nice figure, a nice blonde. How do you call it blonde in English? Blonde. blonde. Uh, but, um, why is the perspective so important to you? Uh, I never see things very, in a very simple way, so I must paint what I see, what I think. And it's also, in a way, a way of being anti-modern, isn't it? Since modern art, one of the definitions of modern no, art, I mean, we've always heard that perspective is something of the past. Ah, oh, yes, uh, yes, I knew that, and that's why I did it. Maybe it was a way of, of, um, of, of employing time in painting. It was only manner. Oh, you mean you're, you're the, the ingredients of your painting is not only space, but, but time. time yes. Because time for me is also very important. I don't know if time is important really, but for me it is. The blacks in particular are making a name for themselves on the art scene because they enjoy more opportunities than in the past. Among the black artists now emerging, Romer Bearden has attracted wide attention. Here's his work as exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art. See, these paintings, uh, a lot of people don't realize I took them from an actual block, 132nd Street and Lenox Avenue. And what I tried to do was to x-ray what was behind the facade of the buildings. And many of the things going on in the building might uh, apply to people in the same type of situation all over the world. It's time for tea break, Rob. Oh, okay. Hey, Phil. Hey, how you doing? All right. Very good. Hey. Some tea. Oh, thanks. Your paintings are uh, being shipped to Tokyo, so I'm sorry they're out here. Oh, that's but all right. they're going to be packed this afternoon. I remember when I was uh, quite young in the 30s, Diego Rivera came up to Harlem and he talked about the great influence that African sculpture had been on him. For instance, in this one back here, here's a woman going to heaven. And I tried to put certain elements of ancient optic art in that. To, so there's this continuity of ritual, of, of religious myth and dogma. 
right into the very reality of what this scene represents. As art has said, art is the fruit of man. Among the sculptors, besides the great masters like Arp, Brancusi, and of course Moore, there was a young Frenchman who seemed destined to achieve comparable stature, Raymond Duchamp Villon. The critic Herbert Reed said that he was the first sculptor to use the cubist idiom. That was in 1910. This, Le Cheval, the horse, is dated 1914. It's just four years before the sculptor's tragic death in the First World War. He was a member of perhaps the most brilliant family in the history of 20th century art. One brother, Jacques Vion, lived to be a distinguished painter, and another who moved to America was the incomparable Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp started out as a painter, his nude descending the staircase, a brilliant extrapolation of futurism, scandalized the visitors of the New York Armory show in 1913. By then, however, Duchamp had acquired a strong distaste for painting. An instant convert to Dadaism, he set out with diabolical intelligence to undermine the art establishment by humorously exposing its absurd postulates and unconscious presuppositions. Thus, he substituted non-art in artistic situations by solemnly exhibiting a bicycle wheel or a bottle rack. These he called ready-mades. The bride stripped bare by her bachelor's even, otherwise known as the big glass. This work was cracked in an accident, an accident which Duchamp claimed improved it. Until his death, Duchamp lived in New York, a colleague to the players of the Manhattan Chess Club and a myth to the art world. He lived long enough to witness the final irony. His anti-art was welcomed in museums as great art. For in the 60s, a new movement born in the United States hailed him as a pioneer. The movement was called pop art. When pop art appeared in the late 50s, it was denounced as the end of art. Yet it was engaged in one of art's oldest tasks, trying to close the constantly reopening gap between art and life, reacting against abstract expressionism. The pop artists reintroduced reality, the kind of reality that best reflects our society of abundance, consumers' goods. Andy Warhol's bland images of Hollywood stars, the Mona Lisa or Campbell Soup, became pop symbols. To convey these symbols, pop artists used the universal language of the mass media. Jasper John's American flag ushered in pop art. Another early master of pop is Robert Rauschenberg. Caravaggio and Courbet would have subscribed to this statement by Rauschenberg. I think a picture is more like the real world when it's made out of the real world. Seen here in his lower Manhattan studio is a major pop artist, Roy Lichtenstein. He gave the comic strip and the Bende dots of printing their passport of high art. I uh, don't usually do collages, but I, I do some, and this is just a sketch for a possible painting or, or print of a, of a mirror. I use just bits of colored paper and tape and, and put the thing together. It's uh, very simple. It may lead nowhere, but it may also give me ideas for, for future work. I've projected up a uh, comic strip and other uh, printed material and uh, drawn it, and I photographed that to reduce it down again, to project up again for paintings. I use any method that'll work. When did you uh, first develop the idea of taking an image that already existed in print and blowing it up to make it into a picture? It's um, hard to say why or when. It's, uh, it happened kind of gradually, and uh, I've been using um, other people's graphic material for work in an abstract painting, sort of expressionist paintings. Now, Roy, this picture here, this one of George Washington, uh, this is, I think, quite early on in the piece, isn't it? Yeah, around... Uh, 61 or two. Where did you get the first image from? Uh, this one came from a newspaper. It was a foreign language newspaper. And it was a woodcut. Is there always an irony in the way that you look at, uh, that you depict objects? 
I think so. I mean, I don't think I'm being ironic about uh, Picasso when I do Picasso. I'm, I'm being ironic about my picture of the Picasso. It isn't to take off on those words. What, what is it saying, then, if we can, we can put this into words? Well, I think the, the simplicity of many of the depictions is, is absurd, but that, that simplicity, uh, I feel, can also be made to be powerful. It can be looked at as either simple-minded or, or powerful imagery, or monumental, one or the other. I mean, they're, they're certainly simple. The international nature of modern arts crossing the narrow frontiers of nationalism is emphasized at the Paris Biennale. This exhibit is dedicated to artists all over the world who are under 35 and thus representative of new values in art of the 1970s. When asked what is art, the German Dadaist Schwitters replied, what is it? Sometimes young rebels of today's art seem to be asking Schwitters question as they challenge and reject even the avant-garde of the 60s and the 70s. You're the artist, Pierre Wolfram, aren't you? Yeah. Can you tell me what this is all about? Well, I give the public to the visitors, and they project their own ideas, and maybe they're handling, and later on they're reflecting in a discussion, so it's a question of communication. Sometimes the achievements of early decades of modern art seem replaced by a kind of anarchy against all accepted art forms. I'm the artist. I'm uh, from Holland. But I'm Ray Stockholm. I'm an artist too, uh, more traditional one. But what are you trying to do with us? I just want to have your reaction. I am. Uh, well, traditional art you just can pass by, but this one you have to react to. It seems the closer we get to the younger contemporary artists, the more puzzling their work seems, at least to me. But puzzling isn't uh, in any way a reason to disdain it. Because after all, that's the definition of modern art. Modern art is a question rather than an answer. And you may say that's how it began. Uh, uh, up to about 1850, uh, 1860, there was a tradition. You knew the values you were referring to. You could uh, decide from these criteria what was good and what was bad. The criteria exploded, disappeared, and from then on, everyone was on his own, both the artist and the viewer. But sometimes I wonder, looking at these works, what is the artist thinking? But one of the earliest artists, the one who might say started this uh, revolution, uh, uh, Edouard Manet, once said when he was speaking about uh, his own pictures, uh, I have no idea of when it's finished. Uh, I know it's right when it's right. Uh, and to uh, his friend Mallarmé, the poet, he said, uh, every time I start a picture, it is as if I were diving in order to learn how to swim. There is no precedent, there's nothing you can refer to. You must begin. And uh, the art of today, modern art, is always a new beginning. George Siegel conjures up poignant plaster apparitions in the no man's land between life Dutch. I was a painter for 10 years before I even started sculpture. Uh, my teachers were the abstract expressionist painters. I loved, admired. I couldn't mesh their opinions with how I felt about solid matter. Touching a woman's flesh or being in a real space, wasn't there some connection? And uh, just my discomfort, you know, not believing their almost religious approach to the world uh, led me to my own path. Uh, here I am supposed to be a contemporary pop artist. All of those qualities, uh, you know, those alive qualities that women have seem to cross the lines of the history of art. And uh, I've, I find echoes in Old Kingdom, and Greek Stila, and it's not quite history, because the people are really, for me, still alive. Pieces like this are uh, hard to describe. Um, are they sculpture? Uh, 
I think of them as places that uh, I can enter. Um, I have to make them, I have to make the figures my size. Uh, I'll build a chunk of real wall. You know, it's a real piece of wall, real window, real curtain. It just became important for me to be able to see her from the front, walk around the corner and be in the room with her. We were intrigued by the now generation, especially as conceptual art and rock and roll protests combined in Yoko Ono and John Lennon. Modern Art didn't know about it until this Yoko Ono non-exhibit became a widely discussed conceptual art event. I'm Yoko Ono. No Yoko Ono show here. There's no Yoko Ono show here. She's doing a conceptual show. Yeah. In which the entire show is up to you. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, then maybe she didn't even have to show up. Exactly. Well, I think it's a bit bonkers. <laughs> really, do you know what bonkers is? No, what's, what's that mean? <laughs> crazy, crazy, is it? If you take it a step farther, if there's no yeah. picture to look at it, and it's just all in your head. Then you it's can, just what you think. Then you That's can what... have a very good museum there. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <me> go. <laughs> Every four years, thanks to an exhibition named Documenta, the small provincial town of Kassel in Germany becomes the capital of avant-garde art. Like an exploding galaxy, present-day art projects tend toward ever more extreme statements. Here is one of the current art scene's most influential figures, West Germany's Joseph Buys. Buys declares, for me, thinking is sculpture, action, course, is also sculpture. Haben die Nachfolgen dafür gesorgt, dass die Durchführungsbestimmungen sehr kompliziert und teuer sind. Excuse me, then you don't regard this any longer as, for example, living sculpture or environment or documentation. This is almost a political office for action. No, no, it has, a, it has a lot to do with living sculpture. My idea of art is more an interdisciplinary kind of art. I am uh, going on to uh, research the possibility of self-destination of the people. Next to the extreme literal quality of today's hyper-realists, pop art looks like sheer poetic fantasy. Take Oldenburg's Mouse Museum, for instance, one of the highlights of Documenta, the nutshell compendium of his familiar sculptures from the plaster hot dog to the plastic ice cream soda. Even his soft Chicago Picasso is included. In his studio in New York City's Soho, Swedish-born, Chicago-raised Oldenburg continues to look hard at things so commonplace that the rest of us don't even see them anymore. By making these objects smaller, bigger, or softer than nature, he turns them into something rich and strange, something in which comedy and grandeur are uniquely combined. And this is the uh, little original plug of all the, um, all the big ones, yeah? Yeah, this is the first one. It's a, um, it's a typical plug. It's not, uh, well, it's sort of an antique. It's, it's not a contemporary three-way plug, but it's the one that suits me best. It has an interior. One can look inside of this one, and I understand that in the Oberlin plug, squirrels live in it, you know, so that it is an inhabited sculpture. You can also sing into it, and you can get a note, like, uh, 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 uh. This one is not as resonant as the one out of mahogany. Fine Cremona tone is what you want. Yeah. What's the biggest artwork that you've made based on it? And there's the very big one, which is uh, now in Kansas City. Many of these things do come from my experiences with objects in childhood. It's, it's magical. And, uh, it, of course, it makes you want to touch them to a great deal more. I mean, which is a the sensuous response to something you also feel for the, for the human body. You want to touch the other human body and so on. 
the, you know, the fans are, are larger uh, electrical appliances around the home, and um, I think them into another, into another world, sort of. I, I look at them so intensely, which normally one doesn't do, and I simplify them to the point that they look uh, unearthly. I, I was commissioned to do a copyright violation. Uh, it figured in a litigation which had to do with the, uh, uh, with the copyright of the Chicago Picasso. And I asked, do you mind if I do a soft one? And they said, no, it doesn't make any difference whether it's soft or hard. So I copied the maquette, but I turned it into a soft piece. And it was settled uh, in, uh, you might say, Picasso's favor, because the monument is now uh, public. Washington, D.C.'s National Gallery. For the first time, Soviet Russia consented to lend a selection from the extraordinary collection of early modern art in Leningrad's Hermitage Museum. Modern art and political detente involve the Soviet Minister of Culture, Madame Kutseva, and America's Henry Kissinger in tribute to early masters of the School of Paris. No one has expressed the artist's needs for freedom better than Matisse, who wrote, an artist must never be a prisoner of himself, a prisoner of a style, a prisoner of a reputation, a prisoner of success. Looking at these undisputed masterpieces, we might recall Stendhal saying, today's classics are yesterday's romantics. When tempted to say about a new work, that this isn't art. Let's remember that precisely the same thing was said about Van Gogh, Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso when their work was new. As Matisse put it, the characteristic of modern art is to participate in our life. Most stories and films have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But what we tried to do is to span a century of the most revolutionary changes in art since the Renaissance. The very dawn of modern art, Courbet said, an epoch can only be recorded by the artists who have lived through it. Each must have its own artists to express it, recorded for the future. So the end is not in sight. Perhaps the next genius of tomorrow's modern art is here. Thank <laughs> you.